Yeah, my name is Alec Vlasnik, um, uh, beverage consultant for Barbarossa Lounge in San Francisco. I've actually spent the last year uh, working down in uh, the San Diego market, um, but uh, I'm going to be transitioning back into San Francisco full time here uh, for the coming uh, spring and summer seasons. Um, and really looking forward to getting back into the city and getting in the full swing of things now that we've really seen the the full resurgence post COVID. Um, the industry is really uh, back to life and it's it's a lot of fun. So looking nice. forward to the next year on the myths, right? So some of the myths uh, I'll say and then you can just comment on on you on whether true or false, right? Mixing drinks is gives you, you know, a headache or gives you a, a faster chance of a high. Is that true or false? Like you should not mix vodka and gin or you should stick with vodka. You know how they say? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I have not found too much consistency in that in terms of, um, you know, there's no, you know, uh, hold fast, you know, rule that you can stick to that's consistent every single time. I think it's to the individual and I think it's how you go about drinking. You know, uh -huh. for me, it was they always said, never drink beer before liquor. Uh, and I always felt like that was hmm. because you get yourself in the habit of, you know, drinking full glasses of beer and then you switch to liquor and it goes down a little bit easier after you've already, you know, had a few libations and kind of gotten in the flow of things. Um, so I've always found it's more about, you know, what you're doing to, you know, prepare yourself for a night of drinking. Are you getting a good meal in you? Are you staying hydrated, having water in between drinks? more um that sort of thing as opposed to well if i only drink gin today then, mm -hmm, then i'll mm -hmm. you know i won't have a headache i won't have a hangover i don't think uh alcohol is alcohol and you know it's gonna it's gonna do what it does regardless bigger cubes of ice you know makes uh, drinks taste better than the smaller cubes uh true or false uh i would i would certainly say false um i think that everything is is relative um to the drink right so if you're putting mm -hmm. together a menu you should be trying to consider you know the, the level of dilution that you're getting from the ice that you're using um, the presentation the mouthfeel that it creates right a lot of times crushed ice um, and the mouthfeel that you get and the dilution that you get while drinking uh, lends itself um, better to certain flavors more intense um, flavors um, you know richer um, uh, components um, so it really depends you know certain drinks are gonna taste best with no ice um, just chilled yeah. and served neat um so i think the consumer gets a little bit too caught up on um am i getting more or less products you know with true. the amount of ice that's in my glass that sort of thing is that um, true like you know when you when, when they say hey put less ice because they're asking for more drink right more liquid uh, right right what's yeah, your no, comment there's, there? there's, there's the there's always a handful of comments that you're used to getting right which is a, a heavier pour or less ice and uh -huh. um you know you're gonna get the same pour regardless right unless you get a, a a very unseasoned bartender that's um easy to sway one way or the other typically uh -huh. speaking if you ask me for a cocktail uh with less ice it's just not going to meet the wash line in the glass right because uh, i'm gonna remove the ice but the volume of the drink is still going to be the same because everything's measured pours. Um, you know, this stuff is very consistent, right? So you're going to get the same measurement, um, but without that, you know, surface volume, um, the, it's just not going to be a full glass. Uh, but True. you'll still get the, the same amount of alcohol, the same amount of mixer, same amount of everything. So, yeah, I think uh, definitely a myth uh, to that one for sure. Women bartenders uh, get more tips than men bartenders. Uh, I would disagree. Um, is it? I think. I, I think that there are opportunities for that to be true. I think that there's settings where that's certainly true. Um, just on the macro, you know, just if you have to but, add but, all bartenders but, and divide by average. Yeah, no, I, I would say no. I would say okay. <clears throat> there's enough um, of a clientele that appreciates a quality bartender regardless of, of who you are, right? Oh. Um, if, you're, if you're executing the job properly um, and you're doing it, <clears throat> pardon me, with confidence, um, and, you know, um, giving the, the guest a, a really good experience. I don't think that there's, they're not going to weigh your, your appearance and your gender necessarily into the percentage tip, right? I think that your, your service really speaks volumes. Um, yeah. today. I mean, you know, like uh, with, with, with a bad service, uh, guy, you can say like, whatever, I'm not going to give that guy a tip. I don't give a shit, but with women, you can be soft and like, whatever, you know, this, let me just be nice, you know? Certainly, uh, certainly. But I get your but point. There, uh, I've, I've seen it go the other way where there's 
Um, I've seen bartenders, male bartenders with kind of rough exteriors that uh. command a really high percentage of tips. For whatever reason, the clientele, they, they want their approval, right? Um, so it. it can work both ways. Whereas with, with a female, yes, of course you want that approval, right? You want to uh, do whatever you can to sway her into conversation or whatever. But I've seen it work both ways with, with men as well. I think the easy thing to say is, of course, women are going to get tips better. But, um, you know, if, if, if it's we're talking macro, I, I think it, it probably Not balances true. That's out all right. more well, so. Yeah. So let me, uh, let me flip the other way around. Men give more tips than women, true or false? I would probably say false. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I would like to say... They don't have uh, to be politically correct here. I'm just asking funny No, questions. no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm legitimately trying to think on, 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 right. my pers on my personal experiences. Like, I'd like to think that, you know, that, but no, I think if you if you have a group pain, right? And you know that one person's going to pay and that one person's going to be uh, giving you the tip, you'd prefer it to be the wife. <laughs> right. You, uh -huh. you generally speaking, you'd prefer it to be the wife over the husband. So, yeah, I would say that uh, women tend to be a little bit more generous uh, with the gratuity than men, for sure. Got it. Draft beers are better than bottled or canned beers. I think it can be true. I think theoretically, ideally, it is true. Um, uh -huh. you, the quality that you're going to receive, um, the freshness, the, the level of carbonation. But there's a lot of elements that go into it um, and it's not you know, going to be true at every establishment. I think it matters how well they're upkeeping their draft lines, right? Are they cleaning their their lines and servicing them regularly? Um, are they Got moving it. enough beer to keep fresh kegs of beer in house, right? Are they going through product? Or are they sitting on something that's past its expiration date? That sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, generally speaking, yeah, I think draft beers will produce uh, a better tasting beer but you can certainly go somewhere and uh, have a, a, a higher percentage of getting a skunked beer or a beer that's that's not going to taste to its full potential from a draft line um, at a bar somewhere as opposed to pulling something out of a bottle or a can. So uh, for me personally, I, I've, I've kind of grown to love canned beers. I think a lot of um, microbreweries are really have mm -hmm. gone that way. And used to be you could only get like uh, the basic domestic Spud Light or Coors out right. of a can. Yeah, there's a lot of really great options um, in canned beers and really easy to recycle and um, it's good stuff. So so for me, that's my preference nowadays. Vodka is cheaper to make, you know, than whiskey, uh, just cost wise, you know? Yeah, certainly, certainly it is. Um, when you talk about production time, right? You don't have to age anything. Um, you can distill and you can get it in bottle and you can get it out right away. Um, wow. I think what we saw similarly to vodka, um, a few years back with this craft gin explosion mm -hmm. um, was really a lot of distilleries getting in and wanting to make whiskey, um, but needing to turn a profit, you know, sooner than five years down the road. So mm -hmm. they make gin um, and, you know, similar to vodka, distill it. Um, a lot of times it's vapor distillation. So the infusion's happening right away. You hit it in bottles and you get something out on market. Um, so you can start producing some revenue and, and sit back and, you know, let the whiskey age and, and take its time. So, um, yeah, definitely clear spirits, vodka in particular, um, is going to be the quickest, easiest to make for sure. And how do you create crushed ice without any machine? If you have, you know, are there any hacks there? Any things that you do to create a nice crushed ice? It's funny now. It's been it's it's so old school that it is a hack, but it used to just be what everyone did was a, a Lewis bag, um, which is just simply a, a canvas bag that you would fill with ice, um, cinch it tight at the end, and then you'd beat it with a mallet and and Got break it. the ice up into crushed sure. ice. Um, so I've had that um, at a few bars in the past where limited space, uh, no room for for equipment, that sort of thing. But you want to do some different ice. Um, so we've had a lot of fun with with Lewis bags. I think they're a great option and a great way to get out some frustration during the shift. You know, worst case scenario, <laughs> you had a, a couple bags of ice and you feel a lot better about the about the night. So uh, how do you greet personally uh, a customer? You know, what's your style? I genuinely, you know, I try to 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 keep a balance of professionalism with at the same time as making you feel comfortable, making you feel like you're a friend. Um, I think that's the beauty of the bar versus, you know, table service, right, is table service, there's a lot more expectation in terms of mm. delivering a very polished, um, you know, sort of performance um, from start to finish. 
Whereas the bar, they, they kind of want to feel involved. They want to feel like a part of it. Um, you'd much rather have your friends serving you a drink than, you know, um, you know, someone truly serving you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so attentiveness, I think is number one, right. Just mm -hmm. making sure that people know that they're seen and that they're heard. And if you're busy, so acknowledge what, what, what is that opening line? A couple of lines that you, you know, you just use okay, that, Hey, yeah. good afternoon. Good morning. Like what, give me the couple of lines, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's just whatever comes genuinely. I, I try not to do more than beyond a, of, um, Hey folks, how are we doing this evening? Or, Got it. um, you know, I, I get caught using guys a lot. Um, uh, which, you know, and it, 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 sometimes I've gotten, you know, uh, chastised a little bit for using it with larger groups of people. And, but it's like, come on, it's, this is, we're, we're buddies, right? We're friends. Hey guys, how are we doing? Welcome in, you know, come on in, have a drink. Here's a menu. You know, what can we do for you today? How's your day going? Like get the sure. small talk going as soon as possible. Hit them with a couple of simple questions. Where are you guys coming in from? Um, you know, uh, you, I like that, right? You, right. Cause a lot of times San Francisco, People are bar hopping, right? They're they're moving from one location to the next. So, so let's um, go there. You know, double click there. Uh, how do you build rapport? You know, what are the three or four things? Like, have you asked where are you coming from? You know, uh, what's a good three or four ways to build rapport? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think building that understanding who your local business is is really important. So trying to find out, you know, are people just visiting you for one time? Um, or do they live in the area and have the potential to come back? Do they work in the area and have the potential to come back? Uh -huh. So, so trying to generally start the conversation in terms of, um, Hey, where are you from? You know, you come here often, <laughs> which is the, 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 <laughs> the most generic line. Right. But I mean, genuinely you want to know, have they been in and do they have the potential to come back? And either way, you're trying to, to hone in on that and create the best experience that you can for that you can for them possible. Um, mm -hmm. But really trying to to understand who your potential local uh, demographic is, is really important. Some of the other areas that they like, um, some of the other bars that they like in the area um, mm -hmm. and the reasons that they do. Um, I think understanding who the community is, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a similar demographic with other bars in your area, I think that's a really good thing to know. And I think that that's a, a community that you should try to uh, to strengthen and to build on. Um, so so just understanding their kind of daily whereabouts and, and to do's and are you from the area? Do you work for, for me? Barbaros is in the financial district of, of San Francisco, mm. right? So we have a lot maybe of a lot of regular working. people like five to seven, five to six, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, and the more you can strengthen those relationships early, uh, the more you get them in on a regular basis, multiple times a week. Let's define a good bar. Like what is a good bar to you? It's really a pretty loose definition. I think ba first and foremost, quality service um, and consistency in your product. You don't have to have an incredibly wide range of product, but know what you have and have it consistently, right? Don't don't have stock issues. I think that's a, a, a really big way to turn off people, you get them in once and you go to order something, you're out of it, you might never see them again. Mm -hmm. um, so providing really consistent and eager service, right? People that that are interested in giving the service and that's why mm -hmm. they're they're in the industry, I think is important harboring that. For me, like a really common theme is, is a bar is only as good as its staff, right? So mm -hmm. I think um, having a really strong team and um, embracing and, and growing that team, I think is the first way to, to have a successful bar. Inventory um, and, uh, you know, knowing who you are in terms of what your theme um, and mm -hmm. interior is and not trying to, to step too far out. Yeah, I was just going to ask you on that as well. Like, you know, uh, the bar, the vibe, the, the concept, right? Like, so, you know, how do you know that the bar has a good vibe? You know, they say that, okay, I think this has the right vibe, you know? So I guess the deco, the drinks, the staff all has to match some way, right? Like, you know, you can maybe explain better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's one of those things that's a little bit tough to, to put your finger on specifically, but you can break it down to those elements, right? Like your, your ambiance is a, a combination of your decor, your lighting, your, your mm -hmm. music, I think is really, really important. Um, your menu design, your logo design, that sort of thing, right? It should all be very cohesive from top to bottom. And uh, I think in today's day and age, like we have such an educated consumer base, not just in what you're putting in front of them, but what you're putting around them, right? And mm -hmm. I think especially coming out of um, post COVID, we had a lot of bars closed down. 
-hmm. and those that are are reopening you have to be focused right you have to know what you're trying to do conceptually and and ex execute it well um i think the day of just opening a neighborhood bar and you know, you know we've got some knickknacks on the wall and we've got you know a, a random assortment of liquor on the back bar i think those days are pretty much over you have to be focused and uh consistent with what you're trying to deliver um and you have to present some sort of a concept some sort of a mm. theme something that differentiates you that, that gets people excited that gets them to want to step through your doors you know what are your three top picks for 2023 you know in uh growth you know what kind of categories or what kind of cocktails do you see as your top three i would imagine there's going to be continued growth in any particular spirit market right what we've seen in the last few years is is tequila and mezcal has has mm -hmm. really grown True. um i would like to say something exciting and creative um but I, I do truly think that we'll see another year of growth for those two um for agave before we see this level out i think uh some of the you know more boutique spirits um i think will continue to dwindle in mm -hmm. um popularity right we've seen a big decrease in in gin drinking we've seen a big de decrease in, in brandy drinking um cognac still stays strong uh it always seems to stay strong you, you I, think I bourbon, see... bourbons will continue as well being hot i mean there's always going to be in a avid consumer base for 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 whiskey for american bourbon in particular right um and international whiskey japanese whiskey has seen um a really big boom and if we're reach a point where inventory catches up a little bit then i think you can see that market really explode right now i think there's a lot of people that really want to get into japanese whiskey and really interested but are just having a really hard time finding it where do you see this non-alcohol movement going like are, have you seen people asking and are you seeing are you adding uh, some are you changing menu so interestingly enough i've seen a bit of a, a dip now we're in dry january because yeah so of course it. yeah so it's it's going to be uh, a trending topic for the next month or so um but i would say going back three to five years ago i had seen our non-alcoholic cocktail sales surpass our wine sales wow um, which is really saying something right um and now uh we're at the point now where the it, i don't know what what happened uh, you know these things trends uh, come and go quickly but people seem less interested in the full non-alcoholic mixed cocktail right and are oh. more happy with uh, a simpler option um and not paying the you know near full price and not having the full experience um yep. for the mocktail um so for for whatever reason i have seen that trend um kind of subside a little bit uh, in the last last couple of years mm -hmm.